Welcome to the third message in this year's Christmas series, Light of the World. Keep watching as we look at the difference between the common idea that Jesus came as a light of our world and the Bible's teaching that Jesus was the light. As John 1, 9 says, the true light which gives light to everyone. We come together this morning and, it's, and it's, it is fun to come together on a Christmas morning and New Year's Eve. And, you know, I had to get all ready. My, you know, I even wore my Christmas tie. My kids got me this back a couple years ago. They said I didn't have anything Christmassy enough. And it's in, in generally in good taste. And I say generally, I think it really looks nice. The part that's the general is that it's also kind of a musical tie. And, and, uh, and, and, and so my, my only fear in wearing this is that I'm going to be able to like halfway and hit the table and then set it off. And then, you know, it's kind of uh, add a little bit of musical accompaniment to my preaching. So... And, and the problem is, once it gets going, I can't turn it off. And <laughs> it's interesting, though, is we, you know, we think about that, and we think about our dress and what we do, and we're all excited. And, and, uh, and, and as we get ready for this Sunday morning, you know, one of the things that is neat is that it is neat for us to be able to have this extra time to be able to reflect upon what the meaning of Christmas is. I know I, uh, we didn't know even what to expect because it's been so long. The last time that Christmas Eve was on a Sunday was, I think, 12 years ago because it skipped le- leap year last year. And we weren't sure how many people would be here and, you know, what, what to, how to plan this. And, and, uh, and, you know, I know that it's exciting. I've talked to some people that said, well, yeah, our tradition is that we always have things in the afternoon and evening. So they were excited to be able to come to a service this morning because they usually don't have an opportunity to because of family traditions. And... Um, you know, but, but in the midst of this, it's a ch- chance for us all to step back and reflect upon the meaning of the season. And if you came this morning, I hope you come back this evening because it's, we, we've got more than enough cultural perspective of Christmas. And you know, even if we have two services on Christmas Eve, that's not too much. And because of the challenge is how do we remember the reason for the season? How do we keep Christ in Christmas? And all the busyness and all the, the, you know, the things that we hear from the culture especially if we have kids, even they, I think that's even more challenging because there's so much commercialism and advertising and, and it's all about the things that we get. In fact, I ran across a story that kind of illustrated this. A couple was, was trying to deal with their, with their one son and, uh, and he had become so focused. You know, he's a, he, had, he had some behavioral issues in general and, but especially through Christmas, it seemed that he got more and more focused on just the material aspect of it and and, uh, and it was really made clear, one day they walked in and he was in the middle of writing a letter to Santa Claus and it was listing all the things that he wanted for Christmas. It was 12 pages long. <laughs> and so they, okay, we've got a problem. So the dad uh, took the boy and he said, okay, you, you, know, you don't get this. You don't understand what Christmas is all about. And he, he brought him into the living room and he sat him down in front of the nativity scene and he said, you've heard this story before. You know that it's about Jesus being born. He said, I want you to sit here in front of the scene for a while and reflect upon what the meaning of Christmas is. And, and when you're ready, I want you to then go and write a letter to Jesus. So the boy sat there for, for what seemed forever, reflecting on it. It must have been at least five minutes. And, um, and, and finally he gets up and he goes to his room and he gets a paper and pencil and he begins to write a letter. And he writes, dear Jesus, if you bring me all the presents I want, I'll be a good boy for the whole year. And then he thinks about it, and he tears it up, and he throws it in the garbage, and he thinks about it some more, and then he comes back, and he says, Dear Jesus, if you bring me all the presents I want, then I'll be a good boy for a month. And then he thinks about it, and he tears it up, and he gets up, and he walks out to the living room, and he looks at the nativity scene, and he sits there, and he just thinks for a while. And then quietly, he goes over, and he bends down, and he picks up the little figurine of of Mary, And he goes back to his room and he he takes a shoebox and he puts it in the shoebox and he puts it back in the back of his closet. And he goes back to his desk and he begins to write another letter and he says, Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again. (laughs) See, when we think about that, it's hard to remember the whole meaning of Christmas. It's hard to teach that, especially if we have kids in the midst of all of this. And, And it's wonderful that we have the chance to do this. And the meaning is, is, is not only the events that happened, it's, there's a meaning behind those events. And, and uh, what we've seen is over these past few weeks, we've been looking at the idea of what it means that Jesus came, that he came to be the light of the world. 
And one of the things that's, that's beautiful is that if you, if you know the Bible, the Bible has four what's called gospels. They're the stories of Jesus' life and ministry. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, in, in several of the gospels, especially Matthew and Luke, really start off by talking about the events of Jesus' birth. You know, so they talk about you know, the angels appearing to Mary, or and Matthew, the angel appearing to Joseph, and, and, and them going to Bethlehem, and the angels appearing to the shepherds, and the birth in the, in the manger. And, but John begins his book not by telling us about the events, but about the meaning of the events. And it's interesting because John was one that had Mary herself live in his house for a number of years after Jesus' death. And he would have been the one who would have heard firsthand from Mary exactly what happened in the events. But when he begins his story, he doesn't say, well, let me tell you about the angel. Let me tell you about what happened. He starts by saying, let me tell you the meaning. And if you have your Bibles, look what he begins with in John 1.1. He says, in the beginning was the word. And he refers to Jesus as, as an unusual way, referring to him as a, the word. And what he means is he was, he was the message of God. He was the, the revelation of God that he was God's perfect message of truth to us. And he said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And what he's saying is that Jesus was the creator, and when he looked at the world, he saw this world that he created, and he saw that something was broken. And the brokenness meant that even though we were physically alive, there was a sense that, though, that we were physically alive, but we had lost something essential of what the life we were created for. And he looked at it and he said, okay, there is a sense that, that we had lost the purpose of life. And so Jesus came, the creator of life initially came to restore life. He was life, coming to bring life that we had lost. And not only that, but he said that, that he, there was darkness He had created the world and created it with light, but we had become dark. The world became a dark and confused place, and we know what that means. And he said, so therefore, Jesus came to bring light. He came to reveal what is true so that we would understand how life was designed to work. But when we look at this, what I want you to, to think about through this all is that if we say, okay, he's the light, we understand that, the light of the world. But here's the question. Did Jesus come to bring a light, or did he come to be the light of men? Did he come to be a light? Did he come just to say, okay, I'm going to become a source of truth, one of the numerous possible sources? You know, that here you are in life, and you're trying to figure it out, and, and, you know, and here's one option that you have. You can go here, or you can make Jesus as part of your option, and was it one of the numerous places that we could find direction, or was he claiming to be not a source, a light, but the light, the only ultimate source of truth and of, uh, of meaning in life. Meaning this, that, that anything that disagrees, it doesn't mean that there couldn't be somebody else say something, because somebody could, that, but it agrees with what the Bible says. But if he is the source of light, it means that anything that disagrees with what is revealed by Jesus Christ is wrong. It means that if Jesus Christ is the light, that it would be impossible for anyone to have a relationship with God other than through Jesus Christ. It means that we would never be able to fully understand the meaning and purpose of life, that we would never be able to have the life that we were designed for apart from an understanding of a relationship with God. Now, what does John say? See, because it's really not a question of my opinion or your opinion. It's not what what do you think it is. Really, it's a question of what does the Bible say? What does God say? What does God's truth say about this? And so what does it say? Look at what John says. John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness not overcome it. Or look at verse 9. John 1, 9. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And so what does it say? Verse 9, it says he was the true light. It means that there's a couple things that are implied with this. Number one, he's the true light, meaning that there will be people that will present a truth other than Jesus Christ. That there will be claims of light, claims of truth, that are other than Jesus Christ, that are not the true light. And not only that, but it says that he is the true light, meaning he is the only light, that he is the only source of truth. 
Now, what that means is when he says, look at it again, what does it say? It's a true light which gives light to everyone. Now, this does not mean that in a sense that everyone receives the light. Because what we find if we keep reading in John chapter 1 is there's a lot of people who reject the light. There's a lot of people who, who don't like the light, who hate the light, who reject it. But what he's saying is this, that he is, he is the only true light, and it's not only for those who choose to believe him, but for everyone. Meaning, there is no other source of truth other than Jesus Christ. Now again, now you might look at that and say, that's really arrogant, that's really, how could you say that? That's not my opinion. It's not that because I think this and I'm smart, it's what the Bible says, it's what God says about himself. And so it's not that I'm being arrogant in this. It, it's, I'm, I'm actually being very, saying in humility, I, I, have to, I have to make my own opinions really connect with what God says. Now, now some people would say, well, that's not, that's not what Jesus said. That's what John said about Jesus. Okay, well, let's look at what Jesus himself said. Let's, John chapter 8. Jesus spoke to them and saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light. I am the only light. The only way that we will not walk in darkness is by following Jesus. In John chapter 12, Jesus said, you know, not using imagery of light, or John 14, I'm sorry, but he again makes this statement even more strongly. Look what he says. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the only way. He is the only light. He is the only source of truth. Now, when we understand what this means, and then go back to John what you find is that not only does John teach this, but he teaches the foundation of why this is true. And if we go back to John, what John says, what we're going to find is that John says is that Jesus' ministry as our light is rooted in his identity as our creator. So if you want to understand what it means that he's the light, you've got to go back and you've got to understand what it means that he's the creator. Look again, if you have your Bibles, look at John chapter 1. How does it begin? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with was God. Now, for starters, that's an obvious echo of Genesis 1. Genesis 1.1, the story of creation starts, in the beginning, God. God created the heavens and the earth. And so clearly, it's, it's echoing that this is the same God who created in Genesis 1, that same God is Jesus Christ. And he continues in making it extremely clear that Jesus is the, the very God who created in Genesis 1. Look at verses 2 and 3. In the beginning, he was uh, with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So it's really clear. And then you go back and you say, okay, now Genesis 1, let's go back to that story. And when God created, do you know what the first act of creation was? Let there be light. He created light. Do you know what the last act of creation was before he rested? He created life. He created man and breathed into man life. Now again, look in your Bibles, look at John 1, 4. What does it say? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. That he is the source of life, which is the last act of creation. He is the source of light, which is the first act of creation. And all of this is pointing us to this idea that if you want to understand who Jesus was and why he came, it's the, you've got to understand that he was our creator. And as our creator, he designed humanity so that it would work in a certain way. But it is based on its need of a certain light and a certain truth. And he is not only the source and the designer of our life, but he designed us so that he and he alone would be the light of men. He's the only light that actually works. That's, that's the way that we were designed. That's our creator. Now, I want to go even deeper on this. And what I want to do is to now switch over. I mentioned we're going to spend some time in Colossians and and what you find, Colossians uses much of the same imagery, same language about creator and light and what it means and, and how understanding Jesus as our creator is the foundation of understanding his ministry. So if you have your Bibles open, I'm going to go to Colossians chapter 1. Let me, see, let me even put this verse up at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Again, very similar to what John says. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, the first thing that he's saying is that we realize that, again, like John says, he is the source of all creation. Again, verse 16, for by him all things were created. John 1, 3, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Same idea. But they're teaching here that everything is Jesus because he created everything. 
Because of him and him alone, everything exists. And so when we read about Genesis 1 and 2, and we hear, read the story of creation, and we read that that's describing the activities of Jesus Christ. You know, when we think about just the nature of that, we should be amazed. If you, I, I, I love the study of creation. I know a number of years ago, several years ago, we did even a study on, on that whole idea of creation and, and what that means and the biblical idea. And I love that. And I, I, think, I think the more that we look at creation and nature, you're just amazed at God's power and his design. And, and these things can't happen by accident. I mean, think about the vastness of the universe. You know, that if you think about the vastness, they say that there, that are that the nearest sun to us is uh, Alpha Centauri, which is three or 4.37 light years away. You know, that it's you know, it, you know, thousands and millions of times further than the furthest planet. And so here you have this nearest sun that's this much, that far away, and in just the Milky Way galaxy, there's hundreds of billions of suns, of stars. And then there are hundreds and billions of galaxies, so much so we don't know how many because they keep going as far as the eye can see. And God created those things. God spoke them into existence. That it says in the, in the book of Isaiah that he measures the, the width of the heavens by the span of his hand. That he holds them all together. He calls them all by name. But yet then in the midst of that, you have incredible you know, um, detail as well. And you study, you know, you study, human biology, you study what we see here and you see, you know, just insects, there's, you know, there's 800,000 catalog, cataloged insects. I mean, it's amazing that God's diversity and what God does. When you look at biology and you look at the cell structure and the detail of how we're created, it's amazing. And it's so amazing that there's no answer. You know, you can't say, well, this all happened by chance. In fact, I ran, a, again, again, across a little uh, comic that I think illustrated it very clearly. It's, it's just a snowman saying, don't say absurd. Nobody made us. We evolved by chance from snowflakes. And you look at that and you say, that's silly. Of course it didn't happen. And that's so simple compared to the most simple, or most simple com- form of life. And that it happened by chance is impossible. No, we're not an accident by nature. But what that means is that not only are we not an accident of nature where God you know, doesn't, isn't aware of us or even takes a little bit of interest, No, we are personal beings that God created, he designed, that he knows us intimately. The Bible says he predestined us before the foundation of the world to be created specifically by him and for him. That he's concerned about each one of us individually. And not only that, look look again, if we have the Bibles there, look at what it says in Colossians. Um, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And what it's teaching here is that Jesus is not only the the source of of all creation, but he's the center. He's the purpose of all creation. See, when we look at this, we exist not only because God made us, but God made us so that we would exist to honor him, to know him, to have a relationship with him. That's the purpose. We were designed for him, by him, and for him. And if we live for any other purpose, if our purpose of life is anything other than a relationship with God, we're living for a purpose that's different than what we were designed for, and therefore, our life's going to be broken. See, what it's teaching here is, is a central principle of understanding everything the Bible teaches, and that is at the core of our soul, we are created for relationship with God. That's, that's what we were created for. In a sense, you could say that when God made us, he made each one of us, and he put in the center of our heart this God-shaped vacuum. And what that means is that when God is at the center of that vacuum, life works because we're putting there what was designed to be there, that we were designed for him and by him and for him. And life works, everything in life works. But when we put anything else there, it's not going to work. We might find some short-term satisfaction. We might find things that make us happy for a little moment, but it's going to make us happy for that moment, and it's going to dissipate, and suddenly we need something else. We've got to try harder. We've got to go back to that same well. There's, there's nothing that satisfies. And if you want to read a great story, that read, it, read the book of Ecclesiastes. It's all about somebody looking for everything other than God for something that satisfies, and he lives his whole life, and he's basically saying it's all emptiness. It brings satisfaction for a moment, but ultimately it, it, you know, it dissipates, and it leaves us empty. 
You know what we need to realize that again is that God has created us so that God would be at the center of our life. He's created us for relationship with him and when we have that, everything else works. That is the design. Let me try to even give an illustration that may make this make sense. I think about, you know, you know, many of us have a car. I have a car, and when I get in my car, I look at the owner's manual, it says that it is designed to run on gasoline. It's clearly stated. It's right there, you know, in the owner's manual. Many of us have that even on a, you know, when you look at the tank, it's right there, unleaded gasoline only. It was made to run on gas, and what that means, it, it means that any other liquid or substance that I put into my gas tank, it won't only not run my car, but it will ruin my car. It will damage it. Now, what if I decide upon myself that I think about it and I say, you know what, this is my car. So I should be able to decide for myself what is true for me and my car. And, and, and when I think about it, it's, and I'm kind of even frustrated that the owner's manual's there, and how dare they tell me that for my car, I have to put gas in my car. Who do they think they are telling me what I have to do in my car? It's me and my car. And in fact, it might be probably some gas company and car company, and they're in conspiracy to get money from people, and so they're making up these lies because they want to you know, control our behavior. And so we look at that and we say, well, you know, they're trying to make me gullible, but, but you know what? I know a lot of people believe you need gas, and, and if that's what you believe, that's your truth. It's true for you, and, and I, I, honor, you know, I respect your truth, but personally, my truth is that I don't need gas. I can put something else. You know, what's my truth? Well, when I think about it, and I think what gives me energy, man, coffee. You know, that gives me, all, you know, man, so if I get some high-test coffee, I can make some strong coffee, that's going to make my car run like nothing else. And, and if it's a real, you know, if it's a little, little slow, let's go some Red Bull. You know, it's like, man, you just put that in there, and that's high test. And how do you think that's going to work for me? Not very well. And what we realize is this. Sincerely believing that something else will make my car run doesn't change the fact of the way it was designed. The reality of how it was built. It was built by a designer with a reality that it needs gasoline, and if I put anything else there, it's not going to work. In a sense, it's, it's part of its DNA. And in the same way that what we see is the Bible's teaching us that God has designed us, and he's given us an owner manual. And he said in this owner's manual, the only thing that will make your life work well is when you have God at the center. It's part of our DNA. It's part of who we are. And we can believe different things. We can be very sincere, and we put different things there. And it not only will not make our life run well, but in time, it will begin to damage aspects of our life. And that's what the Bible teaches throughout this, that he is the, the purpose. He is the center. And he's even beyond that. He's the sustainer. So if you look at, again, what it says in uh, verse 17, Colossians 1, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That, that, you know, that he's the sustainer of all creation. And basically, it's when it says all things hold together, is when I have God at the center, things work. Things work better. It's not only that my relationship with God is right, and that's vital, but the thing is that if my God relationship with God is right, then it helps me understand everything else in life. It helps me understand what it means to be a good husband and how to relate to my wife, how to be a good you know, dad, how to relate to my kids. It gives me an idea of how to, how to handle my finances how to live with this value system that allows me to build friendships and to deal with difficulty and forgive. Everything in life is held together when God is there because that's the way I'm designed. That's the way we're all designed. And if we don't have this relationship with God at the center of our life, it's not only that it impacts a spiritual aspect of your life, it impacts every aspect of life. Because every other aspect grows out from that center. And so that we were created for a relationship with God. That's the key. But, but why do we have a problem? Because the fact of the matter is that while we were created for this, there is a break in that relationship. Our core problem is, it, is alienation from God, is a broken relationship with God. See, we're made for this relationship, but this relationship means that we accept Jesus for who he is, that we run, understand that he is our God, that he is our creator, he is our designer, that we need to put him at the center. And putting him at the center means that, God, I accept you for as God of my life, as the one who has designed truth. It means to, to, to accept him for who he is. And that means that now we don't just look at him as a great teacher and as a you know, baby that was born that 
that we understand that he's God, he deserves the right to be the leader of our life, to be the Lord of our life, to be the one that calls the shots. And what we've got to realize is any time that we look at it and we say, well, I like Jesus, but I don't want, I want to call the shots. See, what we're doing is we're at the core then rejecting that relationship with God. Our foundational sin is rejecting the lordship of Jesus Christ, rejecting the fact that, that he has come to be God of our life. And there are, again, many people that, that like the idea of Jesus being a, you know, a, a baby and wonderful that, and he's a great teacher, and, and many people talk about what a great example of love that he was, and we should learn from his example. And, but the Bible is clear that Jesus is all those things, but he's more. He's creator. He's creator God who desires a relationship with us. But to have that relationship, we must put him in the place that he deserves, that place of God of our life. Look what the Bible says in John 1, the same idea. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was, though the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Now, what is it saying? That he came, but there are people that did not receive him, that didn't know him. And why? Because they rejected the light. They looked at it, and they said, well, I see the light, but you know what? I, I like who he is and his teaching, but I don't want to embrace him as the light that gives direction to my life. I don't want to make him the authority of my life. And so there are people that would look at him, and what we do is we find some other source of light, some other source of truth, some other source at the center of our life when we try to put something else there. Maybe it's, maybe it's an addition to God. Well, I have God, and I have him on Sunday morning, but, but, but he's not really the charge of every aspect of our life. And because he's not at the core of our life, what happens is that we've never embraced him for who he is. And then we have this broken relationship. See, we have a problem of alienation from God, broken relationship because of our sin, because of our rejection of his place in our life. Now, how do we fix that? And a lot of people will take the approach of how to fix that, and what they will do is they will take the approach of religion. And religion, you know, people that are part of the church, you hear me say all the time, Christianity is not religion. It's the opposite of religion. Jesus Christ was anti-religious. The Christian message is anti-religious. And here's what I mean by that. See, religion is in every form is people trying to find some way that they can bridge the gap between us and God. Uh, that I realize, you know, it's interesting, even people that, you know, that aren't really spiritual at all, you know, if they, if they believe in a God, deep down, we know that, that there's something that, that, we're, that we don't measure up. Deep down, everybody knows that. We might defend certain sins and say, well, this doesn't, you know, God's not met with this. And, and, but deep down, we know there's something broken in our relationship with God. And so what we do is that we have the approach of a religion of saying, well, if I do this, if I try to keep these rules and not do these things, and if I do these good things, and so you talk to people all the time. I'll talk to people and they say, well, you know, do you have a relationship with God? You know, if God were to accept you, what would it be the basis? And they, and they say, well, I think I've been pretty good. I've done enough good things. And our, our answer is always what we have done. It's all about what we do, about how we're trying to bridge that gap. And what we need to realize is that there's a break between us and God, but it's not one that we could ever bridge. I can't fix my relationship with God. I can't do that. The only way for that gap ever to be fixed is not through my initiation, which is religion, but it's by accepting the initiation of God, which is the message of Christianity. When you look at the meaning of Christmas, what does it mean that Jesus Christ came into the world, that God became a man? It means that God has initiated a relationship with us. We could never reach up to God, but God came down to us. And God has brought his truth to us, and he gives us an invitation to relationship with us, not based on what we have done, but based on accepting what he has done. Look what it says in Colossians 1.22. Now he is reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you as holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Now I look at that and I say, well, can I be holy before God? No, I've got sin that separates me. I deserve God's punishment, not his reward. I could never fix that. But God has come to mankind so that he could fix what we could never fix. God has initiated it. And so what it says is that he is reconciled in his body of, of who we are by his death. 
So that if I understand his death, what did he do at his death? The sin that, I, that, I, that separated me from God, Jesus Christ took on the cross. He took my sin, he took the punishment for my sin, so that if I trust in him and believe in him, he now fixes my relationship with God, not based on the good that I do, but based on my acknowledgement of my need for what Christ has done for me. And accepting that gift, so then he makes us holy and blameless, not based on us being that, I could never be that, but based on my accepting the gift that God has done for me. Jesus Christ came and lived the perfect life. There was no sin in him. He was perfect. He was you know, without blame. And so that, so that he would come and that he would die and that he would fix the problem of alienation that was between me and God. See, his ministry is one about reconciliation. Everything, if you want to know why Jesus came, he came, yes, as a baby, so that he would grow up and that he would die on the cross so that he would restore the relationship between us and God that was broken that we could never do. See, we were alienated from God. We could never fix the gap between us and God. We were without hope. We could never do it by our own initiative, but the story of Christmas is God taking the initiative for us. And when you look at Christmas, it's about a gift. It's about a gift that was given to each one of us, a gift of Jesus Christ. And, and when we think about that, that's what, that's what the whole picture is. You see, but when you think about the gift, you can have a gift that is there and it's wrapped and it's under the tree and if we never take it and unwrap it, it still never is ours. See, it's not only a question of, do you understand what it means that Jesus came, that he was the light, the light that gives light to all men, the only source of truth. The question is, now have you made that personal? I see just some closing questions to ask this. Have you been reconciled with God? There isn't a single one of us in here that doesn't need it. Because all of us, the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us need it. I'm not saying to anybody, well, you look down, well, you're a sinner. No, we're all sinners. And the question that we have here isn't that we're, whether we're sinners and separated from God. It's a question of whether you've admitted that and asked Jesus Christ to forgive you so that you would be reconciled or whether you're still there and you know about it, but you've never accepted the gift that he's offered. Have you ever been reconciled between you and God? See, it's really asking another, another way, same question. Have you ever made Jesus Christ the light of your world? And I hope and pray that this Christmas that you not only remember that he's the light of the world and what it means in the incarnation, but that you know what it means for you personally. And that could be something as simple as, 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 as and, and many of us have come to this point where we said, just a prayer, God, I agree with you, I'm a sinner, I agree with you, I can never fix myself by my own effort. And I thank you that it's not about me trying to fix it through religion or being good, but I thank you that, that you made a way, that you, the story of Christianity is about you initiating, about you coming to me. Jesus, I admit my need, and I thank you for Jesus dying on the cross. I ask you to forgive my sins through what Jesus did. I ask you to give me your righteousness. God, I need that relationship with you. I give you the right to be Lord and King of my life. My friends, if you've never done that, I'd invite you to do so this morning. You know, right where you're at, and I would love to talk with you today, this week, there are any, any staff, uh, any leaders here would love to talk with you about that. You know, even after the service, we'd love to talk with you, even talk, you know, pray some after. And, but you can right there just to say, God, I admit my need. I ask you to forgive me through Jesus Christ. And you can enter into this Christmas not only knowing what he came to do, what it means, but what it means to you, that you've been reconciled with God, that he is not only the light of the world, but he is the light of your, your world and of your life. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions about what we talked about, Jesus Christ or church, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, or by email. The links are in the description.